Dear participants, dear colleagues, welcome to our event, AI and Equal Opportunities, How Fair or How Unfair is Artificial Intelligence? I'm very happy to see so many of you here with us for this great topic, because today's discussion is part of the View Matters series, which aims at bridging the gap between academic research on the one hand and pressing challenges of our society on the other, and this is a pressing challenge. As Vice Rector for Human Resources and Digital Infrastructure, uh, diversity management is one of my tasks, and once a year, we organize the so-called diversity talk as part of the VU Matters series. And I'm very delighted to host an event that will shed light on one of the most critical topics of our times, and the number of participants shows that you see it as a very critical issue and a crucial issue for us as well. So AI, or artificial intelligence, has rapidly transformed the way we live, the way we work, and the way we interact with the world. It's embedded in our daily lives, even if we do not realize that. It helps us make decisions in finance, healthcare, education, and I'm sorry to say also sometimes in criminal justice. I'm a law professor, so that especially, is especially disturbing for our way of seeing things. But it's here, and it personalizes our online experiences, starting with shopping recommendations over social media content and other areas. We have autonomous vehicles powered by AI. We have their, its assistance in medical diagnosis, and it's important for students and teachers as well. And it will, of course, increasingly become so, and this is obviously the part which interests me most professionally at, at this stage. But do we know how these systems actually work? Can we ensure that they are fair and just? Because there is a huge catch. AI systems are a reflection of the data and the assumptions they are fed with. So this is where the challenge lies. Um, AI can perpetuate bias and discrimination it can mirror the inequalities present in the data it learns from. For example, if you use AI in hiring processes, this might favor applicants with certain names, genders, or backgrounds over others, and thereby this may unintentionally reinforce existing disparities. So there may be a vicious circle there. And the question, of course, is can we make a virtuous circle out of that? And these examples clearly show that we cannot simply blindly trust AI, but we must critically question how it works and what consequences it has. We must ask ourselves how to program fairness into AI systems. How can we create databases reflecting diversity? And how can we ensure that AI becomes a technology which benefits everyone and not just those already favored by our system. To answer these questions, or to at least to give a hint as to possible answers, we've invited four renowned experts, each bringing unique insights into the world of AI and equal opportunities. They will shed light on challenges, successes, possibilities which lie ahead, and probably also some failures we have already seen. And I'm very glad for all of you for joining us today and, sh and sh um, sharing your insights with us. And thank you, John Pocinek, for moderating this discussion. I would also like to take this opportunity to welcome all participants, all alumni, and also especially the faculty of the MBI Digital Transformation and Data Science, as well as the participants and alumni of the Data Science Certificate Program as part of the audience. The academic director of the MBA program at VU Executive Academy is also on our panel today. So I encourage all of you to actively participate in this discussion, ask thought-provoking questions, and engage in dialogue that inspires change. And my talking notes say that now let's uncover the potential of AI to be a force for good. Probably uh, we can also be a bit more moderate in our expectations let's at least uncover the possibilities that AI will not be a force for the bad, for disadvantages. So once again, thank you all for joining us today, and let's let the conversation begin. So our moderator, Jan Pocinek, who is 
uh, a digitization enthusiast and co-founder and director of Now Evolve will now take over. I will sit down and listen rapidly. Thanks you a lot. Thank you very much for uh, opening uh, this evening. Welcome from my side also. I want to do a very, very brief statement before I will ask our dear panelists uh, on the stage in terms of artificial intelligence. I'm highly involved in the topic for myself. I want to go back in history just very briefly, maybe for the very young ones or for those who are not familiar with artificial intelligence too much. Um, the field was born in 56 in Dartmouth and the term artificial intelligence was used uh, from there, which is almost 70 years of scientific research that has been working on. In the early 90s, um, a young student, Jan, was sitting in a lecture, Introduction to Artificial Intelligence, and I remember very well our professor told us, these algorithms are working. We were talking about neural networks, which are the basis for deep learning. And he said, they are working, we can prove it, we can make examples, but we cannot really ask big questions because it would take maybe 50 or 100 years for our machines to finish what we ask them because the computer power wasn't there. Today, we have the computer power, we have the algorithms. We heard artificial intelligence is already almost everywhere. We use it in a passive way. Some people are developing it already as experts for years, but the question is, are we ready for artificial intelligence as people, as businesses, and also maybe as society? We talk about a resource, and artificial intelligence is called a general purpose technology, like electricity. We don't know yet what will be the applications in five or ten years. We just have the rough idea there will be a lot, and it will be very important impactful and transformative. So we have a new resource and with each resource comes the question, how is the resource available? How is the resource distributed? And how do we deal with the opportunities and with the potentials that we can collect or leverage using these resources? And resource distribution and usage never is fair or balanced. It's a dilemma that we already have for a very long time, and now we have a new dilemma. But this dilemma, let's say, is hitting us rather quickly. So when we look at how quick those solutions now are entering society, for all of you who are not experts in the fields, or maybe not nerds, uh, maybe it's just one year now that you have been facing, oh, ChatGPT, OpenAI, they released something which really was hyper-viral, and now the whole society or companies are looking at those solutions, which is one part of artificial intelligence, generative AI, uh, that has a lot of attention now. We want to bring our attention now to this question of opportunities, to the equality, is there fair artificial intelligence, and how can we leverage solutions or how can we build solutions uh, that bring us more fair systems? I want to ask our dear panelists, I'm very happy uh, to be with you on the stage. I'm, I'm really proud and excited. Uh, I will introduce you once you come up here, and then we will have your introductions uh, also. So may I ask you to take a seat, come to the stage. I will sit with you and do the introductions. If you choose your seats. And we have been discussing in the beginning uh, when we set up uh, the whole evening, we don't want to have a data scientist talk uh, and, and just go into one perspective. So we have really a, a, 
a cross-disciplinary uh, perspective uh, view here, which is very interesting. Um, and I want to introduce, and then uh, we'll see what your first perspectives <laughs> are. We have uh, Johanna Pirke, welcome. She's a professor of media informatics at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, assistant professor at TU Graz, and the leader of the Game Lab Graz Research Group. Her research interests include artificial intelligence, data analysis, immersive environments like virtual reality, games research and gamification strategies. She has lengthy experience in designing, developing and evaluating games and VR experiences starting 2011 at MIT and she believes in them as tools to support learning, collaboration and solving real problems. And Johanna also was listed on the Forbes 30 under 30 list of science professionals. Welcome, Johanna. <laughs> Sonja Sperber is assistant professor and Ottilinger habilitation fellow at the Department of Strategy and Innovation at VU Vienna. Her main research focus is the role and impact of top management on the organization and its innovation activities. And which role especially gender plays in this question. And uh, this is also affected by the data gaps, especially the gender data gap, and which role these play in management practice and theory. For this question, she currently also is guest editor for a special issue at European Management Journal and in addition also appointed member of Engage EU, which is a think tank in collaboration of European universities. In summary, let's say she investigates data gaps from a managerial perspective and analyzes the effects on the organization as well as the managers. Welcome and good evening. <laughs> Thank you. Michael Platzer is co-founder and chief strategist of Mostly AI, which is a global market leader of software technology, as a software, te software technology company specialized in AI-generated synthetic data. We will maybe learn what this is. Michael, uh, as co-founder of Mostly AI uh, since 2017, led the company as a CEO until 2020, uh, as a chief strategy officer, now became CTO, as I learned uh, this evening, and is responsible for the long-term vision and strategic development of the company. Michael is a world-class data scientist who held leading positions at Microsoft, Nokia, and others, before founding Mostly AI. He was awarded with the Global Marketing Research Award by the American Marketing Association, and he holds a PhD degree from the Vienna University of Economics and Business and a master's degree from the Vienna University of Technology. Welcome, Michael. Good evening. <laughs> Last but definitely not the least, Verena <laughs> Duana. Um, she's a professor for information systems and has the Institute for digital eco ecosystems at the VU Vienna. Her research focuses on the interdependencies between digital ecosystems, algorithms, AI design, and user behavior. She serves as academic director at the VU Masters in Digital Economy and for the professional MBA in Digital Transformation and Data Science at VU Executive Academy. Participants and alumni are here, as we already heard, so you have great support uh, in the audience. Um, and uh, we will look forward also into your uh, positions. Welcome, Verena Dwana. <laughs> we will try to have our evening in a few rounds. Um, and the first round that we uh, asked our panelists to prepare a very brief uh, but concrete statement uh, was giving you the question uh, to really think about your field and how you are approaching the topic. Uh, and the questions we will uh, ask 
and here now in the opening statements uh, of you four is, why do you find the issue of AI and equal opportunities relevant at all? What is uh, your view? And then <laughs> what is your special focus and what can you contribute to the topic from your work and your scientific uh, studies? And in the order that I introduce you, I would like to hand over to you to give us your first thoughts, please. Sure. So first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really um, flattered to be here. It's a really lovely building also, <laughs> just to mention this. Um, so as you already heard, I'm a computer scientist. And as per design, um, I was sort of not really encouraged to get into computer science when I was a child myself. Um, I was a gamer um, when I was already three years old. My, my favorite game was Prince of Persia. And even though I was able to start this game on the DOS machine of my, my father, I was not even ready to write or read yet. Um, but I knew how to, to start this game on the DOS machine, right? And even though I was always so fascinated by computers, um, family, friends, teachers told me not to study computer science because nobody actually knew um, what, what this field would be um, about. And those are like those typical stereotypes, even though if I would ask you, how would you think of a typical gamer? How does a gamer look like? I bet that most of you would think of this boy sitting in the basement um, full of pimples, eating pizza, <laughs> and playing World of Warcraft all night long. But if you look at the statistics, I am a gamer. I'm now way over 30. <laughs> um, and female, right? Um, so basically, the human intelligence already failed me during my whole life. Me as a woman, me as a, a girl, trying to be in a field which I'm not supposed to be in, right? Um, and this is because of how we learned in the past. And the systems we are using now, these days, um, the AI systems, I, I'm not a huge fan of intelligence, AI, artificial intelligence in that regard. Um, but that's a different topic, however. Um, but per se, um, those are systems that are learning on our past experiences, on our past data. And this data failed me. So I, that's what, what is really motivating me, that we need to rethink um, how we are approaching that, that while the human intelligence failed me, that it, at least the artificial intelligence will not uh, fail us in the future. Um, so what is my uh, take on that and my personal um, hmm, um, contribution here? So we work a lot as a computer scientist on um, artificial intelligence literacy. As a gamer and game developer, I strongly believe that games can be a very good tool for that. And one thing um, for me is also the world of games, the realm of games, a huge database base of um, interesting interaction data, how people interact with each other. And as soon as I would log into a virtual world environment, they're, they're full of racism and sexism and ableism and so on and so forth. And this is what I try to fight with the tools of AI. So recognize um, toxic, um, toxicity, toxic behavior, maybe before it actually exists and include people instead of banning them and excluding them. Thank you very much. So uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and to be talking about this topic this evening. And also, uh, Jan, uh, thank you for the introduction. I'll uh, start with the second question first, actually, because um, that's really the main motivation why I investigate that topic. So um, I hold a PhD in innovation management from the University of Bamberg. And during that time, I concentrated on studies on the top management team and the differences between women and men on the top management team. So both in how they get there, so which factors actually push them to a top managerial positions, as well as what really holds them back. And once they are in those positions, how do they behave differently in terms of networking, in terms of how they shape um, the, the strategies of the organizations, and so on. So all those differences have been um, in, my, um, in my studies, in my interest, basically. And while I was doing research on that, I often noticed that women and men in organizations often describe their environment as being completely different. Right? which often is due to the rules that are set in organizations, due to the regulations they have to deal with, basically, when they work in organizations. So I, over the time, when I um, well, investigated the topic more and more, I noticed that 
we often try, especially in the ongoing debate on the gender data gap, we often try to make women fit better to the existing rules and regulations we have in the companies. While, and now we come to the data part, we often, when we actually look underneath the surface, really notice that what's holding them back is not that they don't fit the rules, but the rules basically don't fit them because they're set up on wrong data. Wrong not meaning that it's per se wrong, but it only actually uh, considers men, often only white men. So it's a, a database that of course cannot fit the women in the same way as a, um, the, the data basically fits the man. So we have a strong bias here towards only the male top managers that I investigated. And this was the motivation to actually um, really explore those data gaps we have in organizations. And then of course also associated with that, what do these data gaps then provoke? So where do we make the struggle for women even more intense because there are data gaps that are either undiscovered or some are also discovered, but just not tackled. So nothing is done against them. And this is my motivation for really studying uh, data gaps. So I'm not a data specialist. Um, I'm really more the one who investigates what data um, has in terms of consequences in organizations. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, thank you for the invitation to be here today. It's great to come back uh, to the university where I studied. Um, it is, um, has been quite a journey ever since. So I founded six years ago uh, a, a company which is nowadays the global market leader for structured synthetic data. And you might kind of think like, what, what does synthetic data have to do with the topic today? Um, let me address the first question, um, like why, like what is, what is the motivation to, to think about the AI and fairness? Um, I could not think of anything more exciting. Um, I, I cannot think about any, any bigger topic that is um, happening at the moment. AI has an, plays an increasing role. Um, it's not about movie recommendations anymore. It's about decision systems that impact individuals' lives severely um, on the one hand. And I guess we all, everyone in this room, cares about fairness and about being properly represented. So those, those two topics now kind of come together. And you, 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 you're, you're looking at the, at the society and, they, and it feels unprepared for what's happening. Um, the, the, there, there are 8 million people in Austria, there are 8 million different definitions of what is fair. Um, everyone has their own uh, perspective on it. I've got two kids, they have certainly a very different perspective on what is fair and what is unfair than I do. <laughs> um, so the society has learned to, to have a public discourse around and, and, and reach a consensus. So even though we all need to acknowledge that we don't share uh, all the same opinion on what is fair, but we have learned uh, to live in a democracy, to establish a political system that is establishing rules and laws that help us uh, function as a society. Now we are introducing with AI a new superpower in terms of algorithms that act as a black box, that are not transparent, that are not clear what are the rules that govern actually these decisions. And they are put into production already right now and impacting people's lives. And we kind of feel like being there on the, on, the, on, the, on the passenger seat, not so much on the driver's seat. We kind of observe all the breakthroughs in the AI. We see the chat GBTs, but also for sure also behind the not so obvious um, um, decision process that happen within organization, whether it's recruiting or, um, or, or whether it's gaming or whether it's who, who get, gets granted the loan. Um, there are, there's more and more algorithms that drive these decisions. Now, the key point that I want to make here is this discourse around the algorithms need to happen as well in public. We cannot leave it up to the three to five white male data scientists who are certainly very well, uh, very well versed in writing the code and the, and the algorithms to be also the ones that judge whether those algorithms are ethically sound, whether they are fair. 
we need to involve everyone, and really I, I, I see 8 million people being involved in a public debate on whether an algorithm should really work this way or that way. Mm -hmm. That feels like very overwhelming, it feels like something that you, you might not feel trained to, that you are able to assess this type of algorithms, but actually you are, because if you, as soon as, but you need to have access, and this is the point where I'm not drawing to the connection to synthetic data, you need to have access to data. Without ex you having access to data, all the uh, debate will be superficial. You need to have access to the data as well as access to the algorithms, and then you can probe the systems and you can learn. And then you can have an opinion on whether something works or not. If you see an AI system that grants me a loan, and then all, all other um, attributes being equal, but now I take off my glasses and now you don't grant me a loan, I will have an opinion on whether that's fair or not. Or I think more, more telling than if you do the same with gender, mm -hmm. I apply for a job, all other things being equal, and now I change gender, all other things being equal, and you change your decision, then you will have everyone join the debate and have a debate, okay, is this now fair or not? So the point being, AI is getting more and more complex, has a bigger and bigger impact, but we need to find a way how we can have a public discourse, and that requires open access to data as well as open access to the models themselves to empower such a discourse. Thank you. Really now. All right, so what's left for me to say, right? Um, okay, well, luckily, I am a professor for information systems, also studied information um, systems, or did my PhD in that. Um, so I'm basically trained to think interdisciplinarily, right? Um, so, so when I'm listening to you guys, I'm like, ooh, there's so many nice things you could take away and put together. So, um, well, some of the things that, that I've tried to put together um, over the last years um, is, uh, well, recommendation systems. That's where a lot of my research has gone into, like the product recommendations and the move recommendations, you know, the old school type of uh, recommendations. Um, and, uh, and even the, back then, we were looking at, you know, um, where does bias happen in the search process in terms um, of the decision maker, and can we develop algorithms that take account of that, um, uh, or take that into account, and then sort of automatically de-bias decision making. So that was the first time I was really like, how can we de-bias algorithms? Um, and then with the, with the rapid developments in accessibility to this, let's call it resource of AI-powered AI tools to do all sorts of uh, different things, not just create the movie recommendations. Um, now my, my next um, question is um, regarding the fairness and opportunities who has access to these tools and for whom are those tools actually made, right? And there um, we have another question that uh, complements these, uh, these other issues that you flag with the availability of data and, and models and how they are used to make decisions. I mean, who can actually use them to make decisions? Are those um, tools and the interactions, um, are they themselves inclusive? Yeah? is regardless of gender, of education level, um, is there um, an, an, an accessible option for everybody? What about somebody who's dyslexic? How much utility are they going to get from ChatGPT, really? And won't they be very disadvantaged in the future when in the workplace we will all be given you know, AI agents to support our work to make us more productive and, and efficient? And I'm not even saying that's a bad idea. Yeah? I'm just saying, will everybody be equally well equipped to use those tools to improve their work. And I don't think we are, and I don't think um, that in the um, design process of such tools there's enough discussion about that. So I would follow those calls and saying, okay, we need to bring more people to the table, we need to bring a more diverse set of people to the table to decide what is really the kind of the tools we want to have, the kinds of algorithms mm -hmm. uh, we want to be driven by. If, if that is the case, and um, so that is the, the contribution that I hope to make to the field. Great, <laughs> thank you very much for this uh, opening round. Uh, for the idea, uh, in general, um, this topic is huge, as we all agree. Um, so we will maybe bounce up and down uh, from the scope and zoom that we take. Um, and what I would be very interested, and also for our audience, to 
look if you have concrete examples how you think uh, we should look at things like you mentioned already uh, certain examples and then do we already see solutions? I think it's great if we go out and we have a lot of awareness collected and we had a lot of questions which are opening, but maybe we also find solutions. That would be really great, <laughs> um, but step by step. Uh, so first, um, I'd like really to go into more depth uh, and you can also connect the dots with each other. I, I think that's the, uh, the dialogue uh, quality that we can have. Um, what do you think are the most important things that we need to look at? Because we can look at them. There are certain things which are maybe out of reach, but what are things that at the moment you think are worth to look at uh, and that you maybe have a focus or that you think this problem is something I want to uh, maybe have more people supporting me looking into this problem and solving it? Who would like to, to start? Yeah. Please, go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. thank you. Um, well, basically, I would start with a very general problem. And um, just as a background, I've specialized in qualitative studies a long time ago. So I get to speak to quite a, a lot of top managers uh, during the studies, since this is the main research um, focus, really. Um, and what I always find very striking when I talk to them about data gaps and about uh, really missing to incl uh, include the whole workforce in the data they apply is often really a matter of awareness. So a really basic factor, but really striking how many top managers are not aware of the data gaps, have never thought about them, and especially also then um, are not aware of the consequences, right? So um, this is really an a, um, interesting discussion to um, be leading with the top managers, um, that often they're very open for solutions, very open for really having concrete um, well, advice on where they can change that. Often I think they don't know where to get that data. But um, I think for the first instance, it's often really a matter of awareness that we need to point out where data gaps are. Um, there are a few more um, really um, well seen ones and already um, examined ones, like the gender data gap is of course one of the, the data gaps we have discussed for quite a while now, where there are quite a few studies available on the topic, so how it can be changed. But there are also uh, other data gaps on minorities, on uh, people with different um, sexual orientations, right? So there are all lots of um, examples on where we have data gaps, and I think the missing awareness, especially from top managers who are then in the end often, of course, responsible for creating concrete measures to actually then really also changing the existing rules and the existing um, really behavior of the company. Um, that is often missing. And w without uh, naming any companies, but uh, can you tell <laughs> us how do they translate this problem as soon as they understand it in terms of where do they really see the problem coming up? Well, I think for the first um, place, I think many of the companies didn't really think about that in that much detail, right? So they notice often that some of the, the really, um, well, rules they have, either, either really written down rules or more um, inherent rules, um, they notice they do not fit all of the people in their workforce, but I don't think they all analyze in very much detail what really the, the problem behind it is, right? So uh, just let me give you an example because you were asking for yes. examples, right? So um, when we look, for example, at the area of uh, promotion criteria in um, organizations, mm -hmm. so how people actually get promoted from lower managerial levels than really to the top management level. There was a very insightful um, study from McKinsey uh, recently published that has the very meaningful title. Um, it's called A Woman Matter. So um, what they investigated is they looked at different companies and looked um, at how they actually shape their um, criteria to be promoted to top managerial positions. And one of the companies had a um, criteria set um, that was called um, from the top managers or from the current managers to be promoted to top managerial positions. They would ask a, a complete flexibility in terms of where they work and also a total geographic, um, geographical flexibility of traveling, which we know from prior um, search, from prior research, is actually a very well, pro-male and pro-childless um, 
formulation of such promotion criteria, right? So when we go through all the criteria that have been named there, we often realize that they have a, a bias within the formulation, so they exclude certain, well, certain people of the overall workforce, right? And I think that's really the, the underlying problem, that we're often not talking about a very um, so-called overt discrimination, so nothing that we can really say women are excluded somewhere really um, more um, obviously, but it's a so-called um, non-overt discrimination. So by creating such criteria that we know do not fit women as well as they fit men, we exclude them in a very unconscious way. Great. Yeah. So I, I already learned a lot while sitting here in the podium <laughs> about the gender data gap, and I'm, I'm the type of uh, manager that was not aware. Um, and I was kind of, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was kind of thinking um, also an, a, another example. And there was recently the news that um, the, the the car manufacturers start using female crash test dummies. Mm -hmm. um, so please tell me if this is, is a bad analogy, but. If, you, if you're collecting for 30 years uh, how um, yeah. a crash, uh, if, you, if you drive a car against a wall with 50 <laughs> kilometers per hour, but you have always tested on the same male person, it's one, 180 mm -hmm. tall, mm -hmm. and you have never even thought about gathering the data. Mm -hmm. um, and the, here's then the analogy to, or here, here's then the jump towards the AI algorithms. Like you're not gonna, uh, supposed to just stress test your algorithms with Max Mustermann or, or, or John Doe, and also not just with John Doe and Jane Doe. You, you really need the full diversity of uh, representation of your population, and that also includes the, 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 the minor segments, mm -hmm. uh, the underrepresented segments, in order to, to stress test the algorithms, and then to really see, okay, how do they perform? Not as an average, because maybe in average you're good, but if you then start figuring out and zooming in and you, 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 you find out that there's a certain segment that you first have not even gathered the data and then if you stress test with that type of data, the system just fails, mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's, it, it just has negative consequences mm -hmm. for, for uh, both the organization as well as the, the end consumers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Could I just add to that example yeah. because I think that's actually really good to explain that. Um, even though the, the female crash test dummies are today often used within the, um, the crash test, they are still not obligatory to be used, right? So I think this is really also a problem where we could ask for so much more input from the legislative side, right? If it would be really a general well, obligation for the, 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 the crash test to actually include female and male dummies, as well, there has been a long discussion about uh, children's dummies, right? So they have completely different measurements than adults do. So why are they not included? Right? And, 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 and I assume then the, the male sits on the driving seat and yes. the female sits on the passenger <laughs> seat and then, <laughs> then you crash the car and that's your happy... Yeah. That's, that's, uh, so, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That would be so easy to change, actually, and it we is. know from tests that the consequences for women are really significant because you just imagine that when you, you hit a wall with a high speed, of course, the force on the body hits you some specific, specific areas, right? So if you're much t um, taller or then smaller for the, for the woman driver, um, you have the forces on your body working completely in different areas. So that's so easy to change when you use those uh, crash test dummies for females as well in the tests, but it's still not, not done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, only partly. Mm -hmm. May I ask you also if you can mm -hmm. add different examples or if you want to connect uh, on these points? Yeah, no, um, so, so a little bit um, connecting that um, it's, it's not as easy to add uh, neutral um, data points um, to our current data. Um, so I think at our society at the moment is an interesting uh, point. Um, let me give you one example. When I use Midjourney, Midjourney is one of those generative AI systems where you generate images. Um, and I ask Midjourney um, to look, give me a picture of a gamer. What did I get? I got uh, three uh, boys sitting in the basement and one orc. <laughs> what? Um, and this, this is like very ridiculous, but this is the, the, the past history of how we collect the data. And what we see these days, for instance, I don't know if you noticed a lot of the Ring uh, discussion when they had the new TV show and they added because they wanted to represent our society now, 
and not how it was written back then. And they added black characters, black dwarfs um, to the story. And um, there was a big um, shout, shout uh, screaming actually from parts of our society who do not want to have black elves because it's their history um, back then when they wrote, uh, when, when this book was written, that there was not supposed to be black elves, which is not mm -hmm. true by the way, but actually this is how our society is split these days that there's actually a little bit of a revolution against gender, a gender, uh, the, 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 the gender speech, against um, um, our efforts to make it neutral again mm -hmm. through, through efforts like yeah, you just discussed. So what would be a good solution for what I just told you? The data tells the algorithm, hey, all of our data of, of gamers we have, it's male, it's boys, it's sitting in the basement, or it's an orc. Good. Um, what I would love the algorithm to do, to give, and this is what it, it's doing right now, because they added it manually, um, that it should be at least 50% um, female. So if you look for a gamer, you get now two girls and two boys. Um, is this the way it's supposed to be? And this is an interesting discussion point, um, which I cannot answer these days, because there's no solution to that. Because it's not the truth, it's how many of us would like the truth to be, um, how it's currently, but it's not the historic data set. Um, so it's, there, there's no correct answer to that. I, th I, I would love to see that, because it's including me. And I would rather like to see, for instance, I, as a computer scientist, I did not have a single professor um, in, in my studies at all. But now that I'm a female um, computer scientist professor, I can see so many more girls starting and approaching me and because they have a role model. And I would love to has, do the algorithm the same, to give me role models or give me things which are supposed to be nice. But it should be transparent. And I think one of the key points, because I don't know the answer for that one. I, I know it should be transparent and we should be aware of what the algorithm does, but probably most of us aren't because we are not educated about how the algorithm works. What the, we, we don't know about the data sources, we already had that topic, but most of us are using those systems but have no idea how the algorithm behind it works. We don't need to have all the details, but I, I feel like a basic computer science literacy and AI literacy should be key and as soon as possible. Kids should learn that. Yeah, and that is uh, actually, um, uh, also kind of where, where we're coming from with our research, right? Where we're saying, yeah, make those tools accessible. Um, and the question then is, of course, yeah, what level of expertise can, can we expect? And uh, I mean, in the long run, perhaps if we start, you know, teaching AI literacy um, to kids, that is a problem that will, to a degree, solve, solve itself. But especially, like, at the moment, so what, what we are seeing, the kinds of jobs that are projected, um, by like, lots of consulting uh, studies to be either supplemented or supported by AI-powered tools are, for example, lots of clerical work, like administrative mm. work. Yeah? Now, when we're looking at who, what, what is the demographic who is filling these mm. jobs, they're very often women, and those women very often have, or men for that matter, um, who have uh, child-raising uh, responsibilities, who have caring responsibilities, because these types of jobs, um, at least in Europe, very often they tend to be long-term, reliable jobs where you can adjust your working hours to your needs. So very attractive for a demographic that has other responsibilities that are from a societal point of view, we want them to fulfill, right? Um, um, and uh, so now, especially this demographic is, is at risk, perhaps, of not having the necessary literacy, not having the necessary tools to actually educate themselves or access to free education resources of, of how to then use those AI assistants that they may be being given access to by their employer, right? Um, so, so this, from a like, wider societal perspective, is one of the workplace trends where we're saying, so, okay, so one thing is definitely education, but the other thing, thing is also designing those tools to be more inclusive. So, for example, by anticipating if I have a user with a certain skills level, then how would I need um, my interactive interface to look like, at which points, you know, there might be explanations necessary and things like that to take that into account. And again, like anticipating these design requirements is, of course, very difficult. 
Yeah, if you are an expert and if you are from a certain completely different demographic with a more computer science background. Um, so again, this is also a call for um, considering not only setting out um, like a design theory, design requirements for those um, systems, but also considering the staffing um, mm -hmm. of, those, of those design teams. Uh, so, so that is definitely one thing. And the second, um, the second uh, um, big question, I think, um, that, that should be answered and uh, is, is in the process perhaps of, perhaps of being answered is, what is it doing to us? What is it doing to us delegating decisions, delegating information search to those tools? How does that change us, our problem-solving strategies? our capabilities in searching for information. Maybe, you know, we improve, maybe we get worse. And also, um, especially in the context of um, algorithmic um, decision-making for managers, mm -hmm. how does that shape, like, my perception of hierarchies and mm -hmm. of my counterpart in hierarchies? And so there are some researchers that, um, that are afraid that it will lead to a dehumanization of the workforce, right? Or maybe of a dehumanization of the manager, you know, who's just perceived as a robot decision maker, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah? So that is that's the other part, um, or the, the other big question, I, uh, I think, that, that, that is also very uh, urgent to, to be answered. From my point of view, listening to your statements, which are um, impossible to summarize, <laughs> but uh, there's maybe one thing I, I could find here is it sounds to me like AI is giving us more or less a wake-up call with an amplification effect of what kind of discriminations we already have for a very long time. Because this is our stored data and this is our cultures and our ways how we approach things uh, that we take for granted maybe or don't even see uh, that they are happening. And now we get this amplif amplifying effect that AI is bringing it to the surface. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you agree on that? Or? It's a very dark mirror. Huh? It's a very dark mirror we are looking at. It is a dark mirror, but it is a mirror. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, of course, uh, agree with the moderator, uh, Jan. Uh, very, very good point. And it, so the, the problem has always existed. Um, we humans are biased, we humans are irrational, we humans are unfair to each other. Um, and we could also see this as an opportunity, actually, to start being able to govern um, the decision processes that are already existing out there. So, in the past, you went uh, to your local bank, Bankberater, what's the English term? Well, there, there's probably that, that, that role does not exist outside of Austria, but okay, the, the, <laughs> there's, there's, a person that, there's a person recommending you financial service products and you, you, you want to ask for a loan and he, he knows you and he likes you and he might give you that loan, but if you have the, 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 the wrong skin color or if you're new to the town or the wrong last name, he might just not be so inclined to give it to you. Um, and this is, this is already happening for centuries, and now we have the transparency by everything being digitalized, so we, we gather the data and we can analyze the data, and we can also have the same debate as right now on human, human decision-making. Mm -hmm. AI is amplifying it, yes, because suddenly it's um, a single algorithm that can be rolled out and, and uh, impacts um, millions of people's of lives but we also have the opportunity to, to monitor and to govern that and to have the debate because suddenly you are able to, to then maybe t tweak and to gauge and actually uh, think, okay, let's, let's stop maybe this type of discriminative behavior. It should not, uh, there should not be a correlation between the gender of the, 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 the bank berater mm -hmm. and the gender of the um, customer and, and, and so forth. So um, I try to be, have an optimistic uh, perspective here. This is a, a, a chance in history to start uh, governing um, decision processes that, and, and policy makings that scale to the whole society. 
maybe if I can add to the positive elements. So I see hu huge chances actually that we use this technology to um, make the gap smaller that we use it for education for everyone, that we make um, use, use it for adaptive education, that we uh, include people who have been excluded for so many deca decades. Um, so there are so many chances. Um, again, it's a, it's a tool where all of a sudden everyone can have a virtual private mm -hmm. tutor at home, even those who cannot afford it or who would not have a access to this sort of education at all. All of a sudden you can learn with someone who really cares about the way you want to learn because um, there's not only general AI, right? There are very, very different forms of AI um, we can we can use for that. And especially, I, I see, and I'm very interested also research-wise into the field to recognize how, for instance, someone is learning and then try to provide a specialized um, learning mm -hmm. programs for this learning type, for this specific person. And that all should be equal for everyone. Um, we, we are making, however, at the moment, the gap also a little bit um, bigger, especially also the age gap. So um, I think this, this is a discussion we just had because it, in the end it's a technology and we know that from the technology we are excluding people who either cannot afford the technology or cannot um, invest time or um, maybe don't want to try out the technology. And um, I feel like we are also um, really should rethink how we introduce this um, technology not only to young people, but also maybe use um, the, the, the interest and the uh, knowledge of, the, of, of our children, of our grandchildren, to then um, teach the elderly, for mm -hmm. instance, to make this, the gap smaller again. And this is something where I like, I like to make the references to games sometimes um, in that case, because we also know from games, if I tell the, the parents, hey, your kid should play Minecraft because they're learning how to program and how to become an engineer through Minecraft, um, this, this shouldn't be not my task, because then um, if, the, if the child is excited about uh, using Minecraft and um, comes home and the parents tell them not to use it because it's evil tech or it's an evil game, um, we are in a very negative circle. However, if, the, if this would be used, um, that the child comes home and they learn together with the, um, um, with, with the parents or the grandparents, I think this is something which we can bring us um, cl closer together like a, a reverse mentoring approach on big scale? We having... always grew up that um, we are supposed to be, as, as children, learning from our parents. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but, but even when should. I was a kid, I was explaining, I mean, like, yeah. the, you know, the TV or something yeah. like that. There comes a point in your life where you explain technology to your parents. <laughs> Exactly. That's just <laughs> it started with VCR remote controls. Yes, in exactly, the 90s. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Can that's... you program that movie mm -hmm. to record yes, it? Yes, yes, exactly, uh -huh. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, just to, to add to that, I think it's we, a really good point. We will take questions from the audience also in a few minutes, okay. so if you want to come up with something. Just to, to connect what, um, what you said, I think it's really worth to talk about um, society again, because I think, I mean, what the algorithms are is basically a mirror of the society, right? And that, I think, is a threat as well as maybe an opportunity, because if we try to, well, really diminish the, the bias we have in society, that might then eventually also, of course, have an effect on the algorithms we program, right? So I think this is actually really um, something we have to keep in mind. The algorithms are not God-given. Somebody writes them, right? So um, I think that's really important to think about who is the person or the overall crowd of people behind the algorithm because that's always a, sub a subjective view, right? So it cannot be objective because we all have our different well, perspectives, all our different educational background and so on. So it's always something, well, really subjective from those people behind the algorithm, right? So I think we need to be aware of that very much because we often only consider the output, but the output very much depends on the input, right? So I think it's really important to think about what were the algorithms based on, who wrote them, based on which preferences, who were they written for, only then we can understand the output of the algorithms. I, I really want to maybe um, be very critical as 
I agree. I, I think one question is, you said it's a mirror of society, mm -hmm. but are the platforms uh, and those who are driving the big platforms, for example, are they a mirror of society? And you mentioned the intention behind no, the algorithm. No, it's their image of society that they program, basically. It's, it's and their intention. Yes, yes. Because if we look at, I don't know, Instagram, optimizing as much time as possible mm -hmm. of attention mm -hmm. of young people to get uh, money out of, mm -hmm. of advertising, mm -hmm. which is an intention which is not really what we need in society, but which definitely makes a lot of money for the platform. So the, the intention uh, giving part, I think, is very important. Then comes the algorithm, then comes the data, then comes the solution. Exactly, yeah, but I think, um, just to add to that again, um, I think it's very often difficult for the end user to know what was the input? So what was the algorithm? What's How do you find that out? What's the intention behind? Right. What was the intention? Mm -hmm. You cannot go to the program and ask him or her just because you usually don't know who that is, right? So I think that's really difficult actually to really turn that black box for the end user into something really that's, um, well, more understandable for, for the humans that then use that. Uh, you I want mean, it already yes, through? I, I've got no, this. No, story. Johanna first. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, a little bit critical to that. Um, I think this train has passed to some extent um, mm. because, especially in Europe, we are not the. We, we, we would have been big AI researchers, um, but we did not get a lot of funding. Um, most of the most of the data sets are stored already in the US or in China. So this this train has passed for all the sake of our data. And secondly, I'm also also the big company. We are not driven by. It's not a mirror of the society. It's a mirror of the big companies. Um, to be honest, um, it's everything is really mm. driven by the financial financial goals and economic goals. And, and we've seen it with Meta and um, so fake news, Instagram, um, the suicide rates of girls and so on and so forth. And this was always disregarded because of the financial goals in the end. Um, and um, at, at the moment, everything is in the hand of the big companies. So um, um, OpenAI and so on and so forth, you're we are all supporting companies which are way outside of Europe, and I, as an AI researcher, I cannot compete with them because it takes uh, millions or more to actually build a model like GPT 3.5 or GPT 4, which are the models which are behind um, 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 ChatGPT. ChatGPT is basically just the application which is built on that. But I cannot even do research anymore because we, we don't have the financial resources and, and in Europe for that. Um, and so it, it's mm -hmm. difficult. So the, what, what you're saying would be lovely in a, in a in a perfect world, but this train has passed. But that's basically what I meant. So I'm going to say it's a mirror of society. Um, our society in the in the real world, right, um, is dominated by the big tech companies that are mostly in the U.S. or in China, right? So um, that I think then translates into the algorithms. It's in the real world, in the same case as, as it is in the algorithms in the end. So what I would suggest, what we do, there are like alternatives, also open source um, mm -hmm. um, alternatives, for instance, and then open content-based alternatives. So this is something which I always try to push a little bit in that regard. Mm -hmm. So Michi already reacted, and Irena, you also? Yeah, um, I, 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 I worked at Microsoft. I was there also developing algorithms, and I think we are overestimating the... Uh, the intent of the individual data scientist. So you're, you're kind of sitting there and you're programming and you're, you're, you're trying to please your manager and he asks you, okay, can you, can you drive up that metric? And you're kind of like, yes, I can do that. Um, that you're blowing up the whole world at the same time and drive uh, small teenage girls into bulimia because you, you, you created the perfect addiction machine is a horrible negative side consequence, but it's not that this was the intent with which they started out. So they, they optimized for, for click-through or for the, the, the time spent mm -hmm. on the screen, and all the other things just kind of fall, fall in place. Um, I do think that we, yeah, we, 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 uh, we again, we, we, we need the transparency. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we need to 
um, open source actually, also uh, may, may, maybe here uh, a, a different perspective to, to all the models because the models are so complex that the developers will not be able to explain you how they actually work. Mm -hmm. Well, by definition, artificial intelligence is then used when you, 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 you can have more complex learning rules than fit into our own brain. So you have this super brain that learns all the things. Somehow you have a, you have a training function, you have something that you optimize that you can reason, you can reason around the training data, yes, but you, the developers themselves will have a hard time to, 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 to really explain themselves. At the end of the day, what matters is how the models behave. And for that, you also need to, to audit the models. So in Europe, we have now the, the AI Act coming up, and we have there, uh, there will be uh, the, 10x, 100x more AI governance being established, and that is a good thing where not just the developers have to, here's my protocol, and I kind of did all the checkboxes. No, keep your protocol, keep your source code. We're just going to test how the system behaves, and for that you need open access to the models, and you need open access to the data um, in order to actually um, test that. And there is where I also feel like not everyone needs to be programming. So I think my, I, I can reason with my grandmother also about fairness, and I can reason with my kids about fairness with examples. And Jan, you are ask, asking for this example. So, okay, how, how, does the, how does the algorithm behave given this person? And so for that, you need to have the, those samples, those illustrative samples, and you, 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 need, how, you, you need to interact with them. Um, with the model. One last uh, stupid analogy, but you, maybe you all remember the, the Google uh, object uh, image recognition algorithm that classified Afro-Americans as gorillas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you don't need to be a data scientist mm -hmm. to get the goosebumps that this is, this is really a big screw up. Mm -hmm. and, um, but this only occurred, it was not the developers that, that, that were overlooking this or were, were accepting this. They, they had their accuracy scores, they, they put it out in the wild. The only way that they uncovered that was that you had millions of people uploading millions of pictures and actually stress testing the system. And that is what I'm advocating for, that we actually have that open access to the, to the models as well as that you have some, some data. With images, it's easy. Everyone takes photos, so we can stress that. But with a, 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 a loan granting algorithm at the bank, like who has, who, who has the right data to challenge whether um, the RMS algorithm is, was fair or whether the bank uh, loan algorithm is fair. So that's, that's where we need okay. the data. Yeah. yeah, so I want to go back to the intention, and I think it's uh, also from, uh, from a user perspective, like what is the intention of um, AI-powered products? Say, for example, um, let's keep it in the workplace uh, setting, right? So an AI assistant. Uh, so transparency and the intentions behind providing that kind of tools to users, I think, that is really important because is, is it the only intention of my employer to make me more productive? Okay, fine. But will those data, how I use the assistant and how that impacts my work also be collected, stored, analyzed on an individual, on an um, average level over my department, over my institute, whatever? Um, and I think, and, and this is um, definitely something where I think the, the European discussion started much earlier and was taken a lot more seriously than elsewhere in the world um, about what is actually desirable and, uh, and what are the rules and regulations, a law policy and so forth that, that we need to, to safeguard um, our, our interests. And especially um, considering that um, there's something called like, you know, algorithm aversion and uh, an algo activism. I heard that uh, at a conference algo recently, activism. algo activism. <laughs> um, and uh, that was um, actually a really nice study. They organized um, reddits of like Fudora and Lieferando and whatever drivers um, and um, how they reacted mm. to being algorithmically managed. Mm. Um, and then they, they built this model of like different levels of resistance to the algorithm, like passive resistance and active resistance. And at some point, you know, activism where you try to convince other people to rebel against the whole, uh, against the whole system. Um, and uh, I'm thinking, well, you know, given that it looks like that in more and more areas of our life, we will have access to those tools that can be very helpful. 
Um, but, uh, but what does that mean um, regarding our knowledge about the intentions behind those tools? Are they really delivered to us with the intention of making our life better and only that? If not, uh, is there enough transparency about what other purposes they serve? So can I make an informed decision as a user, as a, as a consumer, um, perhaps? Um, and this then ties in perhaps also to this um, wider discussion about uh, why so much decision making seems to be fear driven at the moment yeah, and, and resistance driven. And, um, and I think by having this open dialogue um, that, that you've uh, all mentioned before and uh, advocating for, for levels of, of transparency, then we can maybe um, yeah, avoid uh, that kind of, of fear driven dialogue in this context of AI and equal opportunities. Okay, thank you. Um, let's involve our audience and uh, <laughs> see if there are questions that you uh, address and if you want to address a special panelist, uh, please do so. Um, otherwise, if you uh, ask your question, we are happy to also uh, give you a microphone and let's see where we have questions over here. So thank you very much for those insightful, um, yeah, um, uh, for this insightful talk. Um, my question, or more, it's more commentary, um, because I was asking myself, um, we were talking about biases in these uh, networks, in these neural networks, and what I ask myself is, those biases, they are intentionally built in, in a way, because, uh, or not those biases that we talked about, but, um, in the training process, one important step is that there is a human feedback on um, the output of the, of the models. So in a way, what we are seeing right now and what we are using, and with we, I mean um, people in Western democrat democratic societies, are using a model that is already aligned to those values that have been um, emerging in democracies, I would say. So that's, that would be my, um, my um, uh, go for that. So, um, what I ask myself is, um, is it really that, uh, because the, the hard thing that we are experiencing is, or the, or the, the problem that we're experiencing, experiencing is when those networks get um, uh, available for people, like for people without any um, regulations or guardrails, as you mentioned, um, then we see uh, effects like people training those models to uh, create racist or anti-Semitic um, content, to create fake news and, and so on. So, because that already happened with uh, Meta's network, it got uh, on the internet, on the dark web, and we saw what's happening because those models were used to, um, to really um, focus on special interests, like special interests and power of certain groups, so I want to um, address that, uh, or w want to ask, um, isn't it a good thing that power is in a way uh, concentrated in companies that try to, or that at least um, give the illusion that they follow democratic values as ChatGPT does in a way. They are really trying to build in those values. Yeah. Well, if I can just, a very quick <laughs> comment. If they let themselves be audited, I'd be all for it. <laughs> so that is kind of like, where's the proof? Yeah? But if they did, then I would have probably less of a problem with it as, as I would now, but for more detailed commentary. Yeah, I mean, you can totally see what you see. I mean, what I, from a material perspective, would always want to add, because you mentioned the, um, the, the biases, we always distinguish between the, the uh, conscious and the unconscious bias, and that has a reason, actually, right? Because um, often we refer to the conscious bias that is something that somebody really on purpose built in there for whatever reason, but what's often much more important, especially when we talk about the, the data gaps in the managerial context, are the unconscious biasness, right? Because that is something that we are often not aware of and that does actually have quite tremendous effects in the end because we're not aware of that. So that's even harder to find measurements against that, right? And that can be against gender or basically against any other criteria that um, we hold biases on, right? And I think that's really the, the tricky part to, to tackle. Um, 
In general, it's, it's, it's a very complicated situation we're in these days. Um, when, when we look at <laughs> many years ago, um, there was always this constant, a little bit of a fight between um, obviously different countries, but what we see these days, and we can actually see single persons or single companies um, having an impact on the war. Like um, the example of the Ukraine war um, and without um, Elon Musk's um, influence with Starlink, um, um, there was actually one person or one company actually having an influence mm -hmm. on a whole war. Um, so I'm a little bit um, has, uh, like I, I, I would not love to be in a world where whole companies um, have so much power over all of us. Um, so the, the same is true with um, monopolies, right? Um, so for me, it's very important that there are different competitors. So I, I, I am sure that with the regulation systems, if, if they are uh, taking into account, um, we do have quite interesting um, perspectives in the future. And um, obviously, like I'm open, I will not give away their source code mo most probably, um, but at least the server structure insights about what, what data uh, sets have been used would, would be lovely to see. And knowing that they have um, um, apl applied um, the thoughts we were hoping um, they were applying to, um, but uh, we don't know. But for me, it's more important that we also have different uh, competitors and not everything in the in the hand of one. Does it, I hope this makes sense. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions from the audience? Over here. <laughs> 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 I was too close, right? You can see the, forest, the trees from the forest. Um, Thank you so much for this uh, great discussion. Um, I seem to sense this consensus that transparency, auditing of AI systems is very important to ensure their fairness. So this was uh, the, the gist of the discussion in the last minutes. Uh, and as you know, there's a lot of research currently and even in the past years on explainable AI. So there's huge communities and conferences. Uh, and I would be interested in your opinions what do you think, to what extent could the work in, in this area contribute to this uh, transparency and auditing in the interest of uh, fairness? So, um, you go ahead. You to go ahead. Um, so for, um, for what, so, so for my, um, let's say, current, current um, focus of study, so potentially a lot, right? Because um, especially like the, 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 the um, um, locally explainable models, right, where or approaches where you could say, okay, I have an output now, explain why this particular thing, not the whole model, I'm not u interested in that as a user, I just want to know why did this happen right now. I think that's an extremely valuable and an underused research, uh, resource in the, in the currently available tools. Um, and, and I hope that it becomes standard that you basically have to include something like that. You press a button and it explains it to you, right? Um, so that for sure. Um, and um, um, at, the, at the same time, I'm thinking it, it probably won't solve all the problems, right? Because sometimes um, it's, uh, even if, if you can explain how it arrived at, at the wrong answer or the answer that I didn't actually need right now, then this again is a, is a question perhaps more of education, of how to use the tools to actually ask the right questions. Um, so from, from this uh, point of view, extremely valuable and solves that, that kind of um, issue in the design process. Yeah. Um, I see a lot of companies actually really, really trying to put a lot of effort into them to, um, to look deeper into this black box. So there, um, it is so complex. So um, and there, I don't think there will be a solution that we understand what is, what is going on in this black um, box in the very near future. Um, but um, I'm very uh, confident as I see companies like OpenAI putting a lot of resources into having people employed in, in those issues. So I, I feel this is an important issue that we understand how the, those decisions have been made and that this black box, black box becomes a little bit more transparent because then in the end we don't care, like we could know everything about the data what, which was used, the algorithms and the, the architecture, but again in the end um, e even like the computer scientists do not really know what is happening in this black box, and that's interesting. Yeah. So, so uh, I once wrote a, a piece called "The uh, Explainable AI Rests Upon Synthetic Data," and of course, that's a bit <laughs> biased because I, uh, we are kind of pioneering this field. But um, the, the 
the, 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 the key point being, yes, that the whole complex is, uh, that the whole model is too complex to fit in our brain. Like we can, we cannot comprehend. It's not a, it's not a decision tree like we, like we used to have when, when we make laws or um, policies that those are simple decision trees. You live in Vienna, you get this amount of money. If you live in uh, lower Austria, you get this amount of money. No, this is a very complex million billion parameter neural network that no one can explain, but you can always reason around the individual sample and the, in particular about samples that you personally care, for example, yourself. So how, how did this decision to grant you now a loan um, came to the conclusion that you, you, you got the loan? And there, you, you do this type of local sensitivity analysis and you figure out, okay, well, if you were wearing tonight a, a blue jacket or a, a pink jacket, did the decision uh, behave differently? Uh, no, it did not. So that's reassuring. Would it uh, be different if you were five years older or had two kids more or had, uh, ha have a PhD? And so you, you can have millions of variations run by, the, run by the algorithm and provide that in an easy, consumable way. And there is, again, the benefit because your, your human decision maker is incapable of doing that. The human decision maker will justify any decision with any uh, lie that uh, he or she can come up and kind of like use that as a pretense. Yeah, no, I, what, 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 whatever. I gave you the loan because of this and that. Um, but not being able to do this actually boundary exploration. And at this and at that level, I think everyone can join the debate. I would like to add a little comment in terms of auditing and governance. Um, if somebody has watched the US uh, Congress hearings with Mark Zuckerberg, I'm not too optimistic if we are fast enough uh, in terms of understanding for the big uh, topics. I totally understand these very concrete examples. So the whole landscape is very heterogeneous uh, and uh, the whole governance maybe will take us uh, quite some time to develop a governance system uh, because those who need to design the governance system uh, also need to understand what they're designing for, which is uh, not so easy at the moment. There was another question over here. Yes, I have a question to the two middle panelists. I think, Michael, you just described a part of it, but my question really is the concept of fairness, the way we talk about it tonight seems an objective construct um, that we learn from the idea that we see an unfair practice and then we judge it as unfair and then we teach the machine fairness. My question to the two middle panelists is how does a machine understand fairness and who can legislate that? If I look into society, we have in the democratic society a legislator and we want that to be our fair our fairest form of our society and we look into our prisons and we can clearly say that this doesn't work very well. So my second question on top of that is who legislates that fairness because at the end of the day if we are successful and AI is fair, much fairer than the human counterpart, who is really um, controlling, who, who is legislating, who, who says what is fair because at the end of the day historically we've always used some people in place and based on their merits, on their judgment, on their intellect to judge what is fair. And if I understand you correctly, the machine will one day make that same judgment. How can I understand that as a non-data scientist? Do you want to start with this easy question? <laughs> <laughs> he asked two questions. <laughs> I, I forgot already the first one. No, please go okay. ahead. <laughs> it's um, yeah. It, that's there's no answer for that. Um, we are we are using a global system and and asking um, culturally and regional very uh, like uh, complex questions because um, every every culture every every region um, has um, own uh, laws perspectives um, takes on what is fair and what is right and and so on and so forth. So this is certainly something which which need we need to look look into. And I I certainly like I'm also not the right person to um, to answer this question. Maybe you are, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but again, it's, it's, thanks for pointing it out, but it, this is something which is an open issue. And I think when we start discussion on a European level, like with the AI Act, um, this is a very interesting first take to, uh, to, to go. And I am also interested how this will be actually also 
then governed by, by other areas of this world. But again, all of us are so different and it has been already seen in the past that, um, for instance, if we, if we look at, at Facebook, for instance, um, Facebook was not the most popular and interesting system all over the world. There have been different systems in Russia, um, in China, and so on and so forth, um, which worked with, with different rules and so on and so forth. If I can go back to, to my realm of video games, um, if you look at the same video game cover or a movie cover celebrating Christmas, for instance, there's not Christmas everywhere, right? So those are just to give you a, a small examples. Um, so this is nothing easy to solve, mm -hmm. but it's a global system. Yeah, um, so the mathematicians like to geek out on the statistical, uh, on the definitions of fairness, and you will find 10 different flavors and definitions of fairness, whether that's statistical parity, uh, predictive um, fairness, um, equal opportunities, and so forth. And uh, I don't think this is really helpful, <laughs> like disclaimer. We are, as a company, also building and enabling our data consumers to uh, incorporate into the synthetic data generation a fairness constraint, so then you get fair synthetic data that adheres to a certain statistical parity. Um, let's say uh, there, there's a statistical parity for, for gender being um, accepted at university, um, and you want to achieve that, and you can make the training data fair, and then any, any machine learning model that is trained on fair synthetic data will incorporate the fairness definition. The mathematician will be happy, and you can check mark, and okay, but this does not save us from the debate on what is fair and what is not fair. You sometimes also need to be unfair in order to be fair, to actually work against the historic biases. Uh, that is positive discrimination. You actually want to favor women in hiring into professor titles because otherwise you will never get out of this vicious circle. Um, and for that, then the... So I don't think that we can solve it as a mathematical problem. I don't think that these uh, formulas can be encoded into law. And then it is, okay, how do we find consensus as a society? Um, we have somehow established a system where we can find consensus on laws, and that is a democracy, and we have our uh, policymakers that, that define the law uh, that are easy to comprehend. Now, I, I, I struggle as well to see how to govern that. The worst thing to have is actually those um, AI ethics groups where you invite the, the five CEOs uh, of the five biggest tech companies in the world, and they sit together with the US president and now will decide on AI ethics, right? No, it needs to be my <laughs> grandmother and it better be my kids and, 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 and everyone in, in, involved in this debate on um, what, what, how, how, how it's being governed. But to be honest, I'm as blank as everyone probably to how, how can this work in, in practice. We recommend to the, to the organization still, um, those are big enterprises, establish an AI governance board, uh, have the debate, um, bring in dissenting opinions, don't just sit there with the managers, bring in the, the, the advocacy groups, the, the, the young student, and um, grab anyone, get as diverse as possible to join the debate um, so that you're not just self-reinforcing yourself um, uh, and create an echo chamber in the AI governance. Could I just take... add on that question real quickly? Yeah. Because um, again, this is not from the AI perspective, because what I focus on in the top management team studies is really more a, a really smaller perspective, right? Data also, but in a smaller scope of the data. And I just last week had an interview with a top manager and we were talking about fairness. So this relates really well actually to what you just said. And um, he basically said that he knows that they have a data gap, so they basically, to a large degree, only collect data from uh, men because they know they had in the past a very, very high percentage of only male top managers. So of course this is the data they have, this is what they analyze, and this is what they basically then use as a basis for all their um, organizational settings. And um, we talked about fairness. So what does he think now is really fair in terms of data? And he said, well, that's really hard for him to answer. He doesn't really have an, an opinion or not really an answer for that, uh, even though he's trying to really find fairness in the setting. But what he thinks about, and I think that's actually quite uh, interesting, 
is he said it's not only about women or men in the positions. If we would ask him about fairness, he would say we also would have to consider how long or how old actually somebody is at the moment and how long that person will remain in the position. Because you know, if somebody is going to stay for another 30 years in the position, it might be fairer to give him or her more, more, more saying in the decision, right? Or if somebody is close to retirement because that person just won't be affected as much, right? So I think it outlines very well the, the complexity of what is fair. It's not only about the categories, but it's also about um, really how long do you have to deal with such decisions in the end, right? And I think that very well really clarifies why so many people struggle with the concept of fairness just because it has so many dimensions in the end and top managers might have a completely different view than, than AI specialists in the end of what is fair, right? So, so I was attending a, an AI conference and there was a, a, another founder of a startup sitting next to me and they have the, 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 the claim as well, putting fairness into AI and, and so I have a chat with them and, and so he was uh, designing um, drones for military. Right, <laughs> <laughs> and then you also Fiat like Roche. well maybe maybe <clears throat> there's there's also between the continents so so there's so many different mm -hmm. uh, opinions we 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 will never f find this one consensus it is the, the so right but I think it explains to a part at least why we struggle so much in finding really the the equilibrium we're looking for right, right. because. There are so many definitions, there are so many different opinions, so many different aspects that one would consider, the other might not consider. So it's really difficult to find really the, the consensus on that. Yeah. Thank you very much. I need to close the question sessions because we will uh, come to our closing round. And for the closing round, maybe we take brief statements. Uh, and I would like to ask you in terms of takeaways, Maybe you had for yourself a takeaway listening and, and talking uh, with uh, these uh, panelist fellows here. And maybe you want to emphasize something for the audience that you think is an important takeaway from your point of view. So it would be nice if you uh, can share your own takeaway and emphasize one takeaway uh, or offer one takeaway for the audience in addition. I, I, maybe I, I shout because I already said my, my, my key learning was that there's a gender data gap. Thank, thank you for, for this one. And uh, a, a, a brief uh, call to, 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 to action, or I would really like everyone to demand data and demand mm -hmm. access to, 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 to data. Otherwise, the, the, the whole discussion will always remain at the meta level. Um, I think it is a democratic right that everyone has access to information and data is information. Um, so let's, let's not settle for anything less than mm -hmm. having everyone uh, get access to data. Um, I would, um, so my takeaway um, is certainly like when we have discussions like these, how I important it is to have interdisciplinary conversations mm -hmm. um, and different points of view. And I think this, this conversation really underlined um, this again. And um, one thing which I would love um, to, to see more often, again, uh, many people are a little bit scared these days um, of, of AI, that um, it might also take away jobs and so on and so forth. Um, but I think many, um, many of those fears can be taken away when you um, um, when we use this technology and try it out and try to find a purpose for you for your company and and maybe um, how it can be yeah um, useful in a positive way so I always try to encourage a little bit um, to try out the the tech per se mm -hmm. well in terms of key learnings for myself I would say what you just said basically is um, that I think only looking at data gaps or overall what AI can do and, and where it has threats and so on, from one perspective is not enough. So we have to combine the views basically. And um, that has to be from, from, from gaming industry to managerial perspectives and so on. There's so much to learn, I think, from the combination of that. So I think this is really the, the, the big asset actually of uh, combining those different uh, views. Um, what I would want to, to um, well, give us a key learning for, for others, or that's also always what I tell my students basically, is uh, question the data find out where the data is from, find out who basically has prepared the data. So don't take it for granted, but really look at what's behind. And then you have so much more power of really being able to evaluate what it means. 
Yeah, so, I mean, one of my big learnings was that people actually discriminate against black elves, which I'm kind of shocked about, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> they, who would do that? They're elves, right? <laughs> um, but okay, so, um, no, I mean, I totally um, agree that, like, uh, you know, listening to you guys, um, like, from, like, all the different disciplines, um, that just really, um, I think it broadens my perspective every time I hear, you know, the, the different uh, takes on, on it, and um, I'm, I'm already looking forward to post-panel um, talks about, about <laughs> about specifics um, and um, yeah for, for me perhaps also like the the call to action um, would be um, just um, to try out those tools yeah and uh, and uh, I don't know try uh, and, and get into a conversation which I mean you know I'm, I'm already preaching to the converted here with academia and tell us about it you know what are your experiences what are the challenges what are the difficulties because I mean if we don't know about the challenges and difficulties we can't try to um, solve them right so I would I would love to have uh, more of a um, yeah a conversation with a very diverse set um, set of people, um, so so we can actually get there to have this inclusive um, design, for example, or um, tools that are made to actually solve the problems that there really are. Uh, so that would be my my wish. Many many interesting conversations afterwards. Thank you, <laughs> and uh, I can add that. I find a world where we get tools which are completely adaptive to the person. Uh, and then giving us what we need in terms of applying the tool would be great. Maybe it's not SAP, which will manage to solve the problem, uh, but <laughs> maybe they're working on it. Uh, so that's, I think, a very attractive uh, future. And my other statement, maybe we should just meet in one more year and discuss it <laughs> again and see uh, how it developed. So thank you very much for the discussion uh, to all our panelists. Um, we have prepared outside uh, little snacks for networking, for post-panel talks, uh, and maybe we meet again really to stay in the conversation because that is what I heard. Uh, keep on track with those topics and uh, be curious, uh, go into it. Thank you very much and good evening from here. Thank, Thank you. you.